We've been going through the book of Revelation since the beginning part of the year, and uh, quite honestly, especially as the last few months as we've got into the judgments, it's terrifying. You know, it's hard to even get your brain around what's going to take place during this tribulation period in the future. Now, as we've gone through this, I'm sure you've, you've said maybe to yourself, boy, I don't want to be part of that. So let me ask you this question. <clears throat> How do you feel if, if somehow, and we don't know this, the Lord said, well, you know, next week the tribulation is going to begin. Would you avoid it? There's only one way to avoid it. You saw this in Revelation 13.8. It says, All those whose name has been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. That's the only way. Can you have assurance that your name is in the book of life? Can you know? How do you know? Now, I believe most, many Christians, if not most Christians, have struggled with this question. Am I assured of my salvation? If I would have died today, where would I go? I know I've struggled with that at times. Some people struggle with it for brief times. Others, maybe some of you, have been struggling with it for a long time. And many Christians, I believe, become discouraged because they're not sure if they truly are one of God's child, children. Not really sure if they will end up in God's presence one day. So today, I want to look at, can I have assurance of my salvation? Assurance, confidence, certainty that my sins are forgiven in Christ, that God has given me eternal life, and he will not abandon me. <clears throat> the key is this. If a person is truly born again, given new life in Christ, they cannot lose that salvation, but they can lose the assurance of that salvation. So when I talk about salvation, what does that mean? You know, salvation, saved from what? Sa to be sa saved, saved from what? Saved from sin, which separates every person from God. There's three aspects of salvation. There's the past aspect. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. That took place when you came to Christ and trusted him as your savior, the theological term is called justification. God justified you. He declared you right before him because of your faith in Christ. Present salvation. I am being saved right now from the very power of sin. That is called sanctification. I'm being made holy. I'm being made more like Christ. Every person who knows Christ is somewhere in that process. Nobody is past it. Nobody's become sinlessly perfect in here. And then glorification, one day when I'm with Jesus face to face, I will no longer even be in the very presence of sin. Praise God. Amen. Glorification. So all those aspects are part of salvation. And Jesus' finished work on the cross is the only basis for salvation. His work is was perfect by his death, burial, and resurrection. There were no flaws, no shortcomings, nothing you could add to perfection. You know, in bowling, if you bowl a, a 300, it's called the perfect game. If you bowl 12 strikes in a row, well, somebody can't say, well, you know, I'm going to go knock down another pin. I'm going to bowl a 301. No, no 300 is perfect. On baseball, Major League, nine innings, 27 outs. A pitcher gets all 27 outs with nobody getting on base. It's called the perfect game. Over 154 years of Major League Baseball, there's only been 24 perfect games pitched. So you can't say, well, you know, I'm going to go out there and pitch one more bat. I'm going to get 28 outs. No, it's perfect, just as it is. So too with Christ's 
finished work. It's perfect. There's not one iota you can add to it. And I believe assurance of one's salvation is an important part of the Christian's life and faith because God has made promises. And if he changes on his promises, we can't be sure of anything. If my salvation is based on my fickle feelings, I'm in trouble. If it depends on me on a good day, yeah, I'm saved today. I haven't done much sinning today. But on a bad day, nah, I'm not, I'm not making it into the kingdom. I failed too much today. But if I'm looking at Jesus and depending on him and him alone, then I can be sure. See, the assurance of salvation of, is one of God's good, good gifts. And I believe as a person grows in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, they could have a greater assurance that I'm saved. As they grow closer and closer to the Lord, they get to know him better. You have a greater feeling of security. You know, just think about this. So Laurie and I, almost 42 years of marriage. I'm fairly secure in it now. <laughs> Why I say that? Because there were times I wasn't. You know, because of me. But over the years, as you've worked your way through things, through trials and tribulations, you've seen the faithfulness. There's a security there. So too with walking with the Lord. If you walk with him over the years, you've, he's been with you through your ups and downs, through your hard times, your good times. So growth, we can grow in our Assurance. And that growth comes from the eternal word of God. Listen what God says. 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. These things, I think it's the whole epistle that he's writing. He's writing about Jesus, you know, and, and there were false Christ in the world at the time, still are today. And so he, he, he really focuses on Jesus right there. That's the context. And he says to you, he's writing to believers who have believed. Now, belief is more than just an intellectual assent, but it's the idea of trusting in, relying upon. As I look around this room, all of you are sitting down. You believe that that chair will hold you up. You are trusting in it, relying upon it, that you're not going to tip over. So it's the same thing with Christ. You are trusting in, relying that Jesus is going to hold you up for all eternity. And who believe in the name of the Son of God. The name stands for all he is and all that he's done. He says I, that you may know with a settled conviction, with knowledge, that I have eternal life. Present tense. Right now. Not, well, when I die, I sure hope I make it into heaven. No, right now, that you can know this. Of course, that's not based on what you do or can do, but it's based on what Jesus has done. Now, having said that, assurance of salvation is not without controversy. The first one is this. You tell somebody, well, I'm going to heaven. Oh, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? You're quite arrogant to have that feeling. My response is no. I'm probably far worse than you are, or ever, uh, that you've ever been. It has nothing to do with me. Zero. It's because of what Christ has done. I'm, as Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. And God saved me, and he could save you, not because of what I've done. So... People think you're arrogant by saying that. Second problem is that our religions are work-oriented. All of them say, you must attain this to get to heaven. You must keep working and striving, and if you do enough of this and don't do enough of that, maybe, hopefully, when you get to the end, God may let you into his heaven. That's religion. If you've been steeped in that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that if anybody has assurance, that is very rare that anybody could have an assurance of their salvation. 
Others say, well, you know, listen, you could be saved, but then you could lose your salvation. If you fall into unfaithfulness, if you commit certain sins, then God will kick you out, out the family. Now, I don't believe any of those are true. I believe you can be born again, have assurance, but at the same time, I believe a true born-again believer, truly saved, can lack assurance. Now, why is that? Why do we have doubts? Why do I have doubts? I'll give you eight reasons. The first one is this, ignorance of the word, a faulty understanding of the requirements for salvation. Again, uh, most people, well, universalism says the only requirement for salvation is that you die because everybody's going to heaven when they die. Another uh, requirement is the legalist. Well, you must do these things and not do these things. Another faulty uh, understanding of salvation which required is the sacraments. You must partake of the sacraments. And by doing so, then you can know you're saved. Listen, there's only one requirement. Biblical salvation is based on the historical reality of who Jesus is and what he's done. And it's also based on the reality that I am a sinner. Every one of us, every person who's ever lived except for Jesus. There's nothing I can do to save myself. That's why Jesus Christ came into the world to pay the price of sin that whoever would trust in him could have eternal life. So the first reason we have doubts is ignorance of the word. God it says, Jesus came to save, and you must trust in him only. Second reason we have doubts is emphasis on my feelings. My feelings determine if I'm saved or not, especially the feeling of guilt. Boy, you did something wrong, you did it again. It's like, oh, man, I did it again. I can't be saved. How could I be saved? And then the accuser of the brethren, Satan, whispers in your ear, right? Ah, there you go. You call yourself a follower of Jesus. Look at you. <laughs> what kind of follower are you? But so that guilt gets you, and you walk around, lose your joy, lose any assurance of salvation. A third reason we have doubts is you don't know the exact time. Well, you know, I, I don't remember when I was saved. You know, I, I didn't have some great fireworks go off. You know, I wasn't a serial killer. Now I don't do that anymore. I can't remember, so I must not be saved. No, listen. And so you keep looking at the past. It's not the past which saves you. It's not when which saves you. It's who saves you. And that who is only Jesus. So the third, you don't know the exact time. The fourth, trials. Trials cause you to doubt your assurance of salvation because you find yourself saying this, saying something like this. How could God really love me and let me go through this? I'm going through all these difficult now, trials. If God really loved me, that would not happen. No, we live in a sin-fallen world, folks. Trials and tribulation are part of it. Fifth reason we have doubts about our salvation. Ongoing temptation. You know, you come to Christ and everything's great and you think, man, I'm never going to struggle again. All of a sudden, these temptations are there. They keep creeping up on you day after day. So you say, well, I can't be saved. That very idea that you're still struggling probably means you are saved. Because the Bible is very clear, even after we come to Christ, we're, we're born again, we have a new spirit, but we still have this flesh, we still have this humanness, and there's a battle that we will have until the day we're with Jesus. This battle between the flesh and the spirit. So temptation is just part of being human. And if you didn't have any temptation, if you didn't care what you did anymore, now I might have more problems there. But here's the sixth reason. Ongoing sin. If you have ongoing sin that you just continue to wallow in and enjoy and go to, it's going to be hard to have assurance of salvation. Not that you're not saved. I'm not saying that. But to have the assurance of that. 
Because this, as you live, defines your life more than who you are in Christ. You're allowing that to define your life. And then a seventh reason we have doubts is neglect. You neglect the gathering together of worship with fellow believers. You neglect the word of God. You neglect prayer. You ne neglect Christian fellowship. Over time, you begin to drift away, and you say, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm saved or not. So all these things cause doubt for the believer. So if you find yourself in one or more of those categories, you're a normal Christian. Because all of us have either been there are there right now. But God doesn't want you to stay there. So the question now is, how can you know? I think there's two tests. There's the objective test and the subjective test. Here's the objective test. 1 John 5, verse 11. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The testimony... The testimony of God. This is what God has said. This is the written word of God. This is what God wants his people to know. That he has given, and that the tense of that verb, it's a past tense. It's a fact. He has given to us. Who is us? Believers he's speaking to. What has he given us? Eternal life. It's not life until you failed. Not life until you didn't do enough. Eternal it's never going to end. And where is it found? In his son. In Jesus. Not in my performance. Not if I have a good day or a bad day. And then verse 12. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. He, any person, anybody, doesn't matter what you've done, how bad you've done it, how sinful you have been, what background you've had, he is any person, any person who what? Who has the son, present tense, that verb is, right now, you possess it now. You're not waiting till you die, but right now. And who has the life. Notice, it's the definite article there. It's not some physical life, but the life is eternal life unending life, everlasting life. And then he says, who, who, he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. If you don't have Christ as your possession, as your Savior, you don't have eternal life. It's that simple. And Jesus defines eternal life. He says in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, talking to the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life begins for the believer the moment they're born again. You don't have to wait till they die. You begin to know God right then. Jesus says this in John 10, 28. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So Jesus is saying, I give them eternal life. They're in my hand, but the Father also has them in his hand. This double clutch grabbing that he has right here. Double hands has the believer secure. You can't get away from that. Well, some people say, well, yeah, you can. Well, how's that? Well, you can jump out of his hands. Are you kidding me? He is the creator of the universe. He is your creator. He's over everything. You don't have more power than he does. The idea of thinking that you could jump out of his hand, it'd be like me saying, hey, you know, if I want to, I could jump to the moon right now. <laughs> no, you can't. And same too, if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. It's your possession. And so the objective test is this. What are you trusting in, relying upon for eternal life to get you into heaven, to get you into God's presence? Is it you and what you do or don't do? Or is it the person and work of Jesus that he is God 
who manifested himself in the flesh, that he lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross, was buried, and rose three days later. And that God saves sinners, <clears throat> excuse me, solely upon the merits <clears throat> of Jesus Christ, obedient life and substitutionary death. Do you believe that? There's no work you could do to earn it. Not one thing. Acts chapter 16, Philippian jailer says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? What does Paul say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace, nothing you could do. Un unmerited favor. It's through faith. And that not of yourself it is the gift of God's salvation. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. If you're boasting about anything that you've done to earn your salvation, you, you're missing it. It's about grace. It's not about works. God has said if you're relying upon Jesus and his finished work, he has put your sins away forever. He separated you as far from your sins as the east from the west. He's taken your sins and cast them in the deepest ocean. He's hid them behind his back. He remembers them no more. <clears throat> the heart of the gospel is 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says this. He, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, never sinned, not once, to be sin on our behalf, to, to be our substitute, to take our place, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This great exchange took place. For the believer in Christ, your sins, every one of them, small, medium, and big, past, present, and future, were taken and put to Christ's account, imputed to him. And because of your faith now, Christ's goodness, his righteousness, his right standing before God has taken and been put to your account. So now when God looks upon the believing person, he sees them as righteous as Christ was. Not that you are in your daily life, but that's how God sees you. Every believer's like that. This great exchange. And so this historic, objective work of Christ dying on the cross, here's a subjective part, must be personally received by each one of us. And when it is, we can know. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Let me give you the amplified version that expands on it. I know him, and I am personally acquainted with him, whom I believe with absolute trust and confidence in him and the truth of his deity. And I'm convinced beyond any doubt that he is able to guard which I've entrusted to him until that day when I stand before him. What's he entrusted to him? His eternal soul. Paul entrusted to Christ. And so Paul's subjective confidence for his own future is based on the objective knowledge of where he put his faith, the object of his faith, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, before he met Christ, thought he was pretty wonderful. He thought he had it all. Read Philippians 3. Verses 4 through 6, he says, man, if anybody looked at me, if you wanted to know what a great religious person looked like, you just had to look at me. But then he goes on, and after he met Christ on the Damascus Road, he writes later in Philippians 3, 9, may I be found in him, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, not being right because I've done everything right, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So the subjective or experiential test of assurance is that you ask yourself, is my faith real? I'm trusting Christ right now. And because I am, my sins have put, been put away. I have a new standing before God. I used to be a sinner in Adam. I used to be separated from God. 
I used to hope that I could be good enough to get into God's presence, but now I am a saint in Christ. I can never do enough good things because Christ's work is perfect, and Christ's work is, in my life is satisfactory for God the Father. So that subjective truth is only available if it's based on the objective aspect. You can't have subjective assurance if you say, well, I'm not sure about this part, about Christ, that part. You got the whole Christ, so you have none of it. Jesus says you must be born again. You must be regenerated. You must be given life from above, spiritually transformed. And when a person is regenerated, it's in an instant. It's instantaneous. It's not uh, over a process of time. And so to be born again is to be inwardly changed by the supernatural operation of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now comes to indwell the believer, literally to live within you. And as he does, he begins this deep, deep change way out in your heart. He doesn't begin on the outside and work its way in, but he begins on the inside and works its way out. That's why Jesus says, come to me. He doesn't say, well, clean up your life first. Quit doing this, start doing this, then we'll talk about it later. There's no probation period. He says, come just as you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. You come to me just as you are, and then I'll begin that lifelong process of changing you. Now, this is key. It's a changed life. It's not a perfect life, but it's a life with a new trajectory. It's not the perfection of your life. It's the direction of your life. None of us have a perfect life. <clears throat> and there's evidences that there's been somehow a change within your life. If you were out in the woods and you came upon a cabin unexpectedly, and you said, man, I wonder if anybody lives here. And so you open the door and you walk in and, and you could see that the kitchen, that somebody had cooked food recently. You go in the bedroom, you see that somebody had slept in the bed. What would you walk away saying? Yeah, there's life here. There's life in this house. For the believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And just as the cabin in the woods, there's evidences that there's life, there'll be evidences within you that there's life. I'll give you three of them. First of all, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you have been saved. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit Holy Spirit testifies, you know, I am a believer in Christ. Jesus has forgiven me my sins. I now have new affections that I didn't have before. I have new longings. I see things differently now. I care about the Word of God. I care about worshiping with other believers. I find myself praying to God. I want to obey God more. R.C. Sproul writes this. How does the Holy Spirit confirm in our hearts that we're the children of God? The Spirit bears witness to our spirits through the Word. The farther we get away from the Word, the less assurance we will experience in this life. The more we are in the Word of God, the more the Spirit who inspired the Word and who illuminates, who illuminates it for us, we use the word to conform in our souls that we are truly his, that we are indeed among the children of God. So the first evidence that there's life is that the spirit bears witness. You know, it's like, oh, there's, there's something going on that wasn't there before. I have a new affections I didn't have before. But second, there's new character traits in you that begin to develop. The Bible calls it fruit. Now you think about fruit, it originates from something else. An apple tree, right? An apple tree produces oranges, right? No, it produces apples. Some people are like, yeah. It produces apples. So too, a new life in Christ 
new character begins to come out of you. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The old nature could never produce these. You might say to yourself before you were saved, you know, I need to, I need to be more tolerant with people. Well, I need to be gentler with people. I don't know if I ever thought that ever before I came to Christ. But the new nature begins to do that in you. As you grow in your faith, your character begins to change. These new traits, love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, now begin to somehow begin to percolate in your heart, begin to bubble up within you. You know, you begin to have different cares that you didn't have before. So subjective, spirit bears witness with you. Second, there's, there's fruit, there's character change. And I think the third subjective evidence is your behavior begins to change. Again, we're not talking about sinless perfection right here, but Peter writes this in 1 Peter 4.2. He says, live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to these, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. In other words, Peter's saying, listen, you used to live like this, believer, and now you're not doing it anymore. And the people you used to hang out with begin to ridicule you, make fun of you. I've told the story before when I came to Christ, part of my old crowd, one of my friends told me one day, he says, is this, this, you know, you're different now. Does this mean you're not going to go out dancing with us anymore? It's like, I don't know if I could do that anymore, you know? God just began to change me, began to change some of my behavior. Because when you come to Christ, you know, depends on where you, where you are in your life and where you come to him, but you used to live one way, but now your lifestyle begins to change. All the things that brought you pleasure before and you wanted to do, Maybe not so much anymore. Now there's different things that you care about. So your behavior begins to change. So those who are generally saved, when the seed of the gospel takes root and grows, there's change. Every believer will have some change, some fruit that demonstrates your faith is real. The amount of fruit in Christians vary. Not everybody's the same. We're not comparing ourselves with each other, folks. Everybody in here is different. Some Christians are not as fruitful as other Christians, but every believer will bear some fruit, some change. So none of us can look at our lives perfectly. But I think this is what happens. You can look at your life and still see failures regularly, at least I do, but there's also some progress. You know, I don't blatantly sin as much as I used to. My behaviors change. My thinking's change. My attitudes change. You know, there's something that's shifted. Things that I used to do and say that I never even gave second thought to before now bother me when those things come upon my life. Why? Not because I'm trying to please God on my own, but because the Spirit lives within me, and I don't want to live like that anymore. Now I want to try and do God's will. Harry Ironsides, a Bible teacher and writer of the last century, wrote this. Test yourself in this way. You once lived in sin and loved it. Do you now desire deliverance from it? You were once self-confident and trusted in your own fancy goodness. Do you now judge yourself as a sinner before God? You once sought to hide from God and rebelled against his authority. Do you now look to him, desiring to know him and yield yourself to him? If you can honestly say yes to these questions, you have repented. And remember, it's not the amount of repentance that counts. It is the fact that you turn from self to God that puts you in the place where his grace avails through Jesus Christ. Strictly speaking, not one of us has ever repented enough. None of us has realized the enormity of our guilt as God sees it. But when we judge ourselves and trust the Savior whom he's provided, we are saved through his merits. Amen. So one's assurance does not need to be based on past decisions or past experience that you have that you keep looking to. 
It should first of all rest on the objective truth of who Jesus Christ was in the gospel. And secondly, rest on the reality of a, of a changed life marked by a new obedience, a new love for Christ and his righteousness. I'm not who I would like to be, but I'm not the same person I used to be. Let me close with this. Back in the 70s, there was this program called Evangelism Explosion. And they, they asked two diagnostic questions, and I, and I have used them all these years. I still use them. Here's the first question you ask somebody. And I'm asking you. I'm asking everybody in here. And it's between you and God. First, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for sure that if you were to die tonight, you would go to heaven? How would you answer that? Well, a lot of people say, well, I, I hope I know where I'm going. I mean, I, when I get there, yeah, I mean, I, I hope God's going to let me in. Second question. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Well, again, you probably go on the street, most people would say, well, you know, I, I'm pretty good. I haven't murdered anybody. People always say that, like there's murders running around everywhere. <laughs> or, well, you know, I'm, I know my, my friends. I'm not, I'm not as bad as they are, thank goodness. Or, you know, well, I try to go to church. You know, I, I, I try to do the best I can. I'm going to tell you what I say, not that I matter. I know where I'm going. Tonight would be my last day on this planet. I'm going to heaven. As much as I can be sure. Nobody can be 100% sure of anything, right? But I'm going to heaven. Well, who do you think you are? Why, why should God let you into heaven? Well, I'm going to tell you my answer. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I come to church. Not because I read my Bible. Not because I pray. Not because I try to do good things. There's one reason and one reason alone why I'm going to heaven because I know who I have believed in. I'm trusting Christ and Christ alone to save me from my sins and bring me into God's presence. So I say to you today, maybe you're not sure, but you can know today. Come to Jesus, no matter how broken you might be, no matter how sinful you might be, no matter what you've done, ask him to be your Savior. Jesus is a compassionate Savior. This is what he does. He receives sinners to himself. This is, this is what he does. And he takes broken, lost sinners and begins to transform them. And he will never quit or give up on them. You don't hit the three-quarter pole and he says, okay, I've had it. No, he's going to get you to the end. And you can never add to that salvation that he provides. You can only live it out. I do what I do not to, to get any more grace with God, not to get brownie points, but I do what I do out of a gratitude, a thankfulness of my heart that Jesus would save a sinner like me. I hope it's the same in your life. I hope you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for everybody here. They have to answer that question before you. If they're not sure what it is, I pray that they would speak to me or another staff person or an elder, another person in the church, and, you know, as, as they, they struggle with this. Pretty, pretty normal. People struggle with this. I know I have in the past. But Lord, more than anything, I want people to know Jesus as their Savior. And not just know it, but be assured of it. Because in doing so, there's a freedom that comes. There's a joy that comes. There's a peace that's there that only Jesus can give. So we praise you, Lord. We thank you for our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen.